Hi everyone, my name is Trisana. I am from the Petrides Lab at the Montreal Neurological Institute here in Canada. And today I'm gonna to be speaking to you as part of our symposium entitled Mapping Cortical Morphology in the Human and Non-Human Primate Brain and Relations to Function. And I'm gonna be talking to you about studies from our lab investigating sulcal morphology in the human brain and relations to specific aspects of functional processing. So perhaps you're wondering why should we care about cortical morphology? Certainly the salsa and gyri form very complex patterns. They seem to be quite variable from one individual to the next. We know that the cerebral cortex has expanded immensely over evolution. This is illustrated by this beautiful figure here of Katya Hoyer and colleagues. And in fact, the cortex of the human brain is the most convoluted of any primate brain. Furthermore, we know that about two thirds of the cortex is hidden within its sulci and fissures. And so when you're looking at the lateral surface or the medial surface of the hemisphere, you actually can't see quite a lot of cortex that is hidden within those folds. And we want to be able to map that cortex properly. Finally, as anatomists such as Broadman demonstrated, and these are his, his maps shown here, certain sulci and gyri can serve as excellent morphological landmarks for underlying cytoarchitectonic areas that have specific functions. So for example, on the anterior bank of the central sulcus, you are always going to find area four, which is your primary motor cortex. On the posterior bank, you are always going to find uh, area three, which is your primary somatosensory cortex. On Heschel's gyrus, hidden within the sylvian fissure, you will find area 41, which is your primary auditory cortex. And within the calcarine sulcus, which is a medial sulcus here, you are going to find area 17, which is your primary visual cortex. And the general belief has been that these relationships hold for the primary sulci, which are the first to form in utero and which are the most consistent across species, um, but that these relationships don't really hold for the so-called higher level cortical areas. And so our lab is interested in investigating such relationships. In terms of mapping cortical folds, it really became possible towards the end of the 19th century when we could harden brain specimens using alcohol and then actually uh, perform dissections and open up cortical folds and uh, examine the morphology. And these early studies, such as those of Eberstaller in 1890 or Retzius, even Economo and Koskinas, demonstrated that there are relatively consistent patterns across individuals and that there are relations with functional processes, as I just mentioned. However, these studies would have been performed on postmortem specimens, which would have meant a restriction in sample size and also a restriction mainly to the cortical surface. With the advent of neuroimaging tools, um, we've been able to study lots and lots of subjects who are alive and uh, study the cortical folds in three dimensions. And so that's just what I'm showing you uh, in this image on the right here. You can label specific sulci in 3D. You can follow a sulcus from the cortical surface to within the depth of the hemisphere. And you can even uh, look at uh, coordinates in a stereotactic space, such as that of uh, the Montreal Neurological Institute. And our lab has contributed extensively to this type of research. These are just some of the articles that have uh, come out of our laboratory investigating the morphology of specific sulci. Uh, we've also published three atlases on this topic. Um, and this is the most recent lateral schematic to emerge uh, from the lab. And actually, we've named some of the sulci for the first time in our lab. So this was actually the basis of uh, the research of my PhD. So I looked at the morphology uh, of the sulci in the ventrolateral frontal cortex. This forms Broca's area for language production in the language dominant hemisphere. I looked at the anterior ascending ramus of the lateral fissure, the horizontal ascending ramus of the lateral fissure, and this occasional sulcus called the sulcus diagonalis. And specifically, I looked at the patterns of these sulci, what is the frequency across hemispheres and in individuals. And I then quantified the uh, variability and extent of these sulci using spatial probability maps. So these are the surface probability maps uh, of some of those sulci shown here.
So armed with a more extensive understanding of sulcal morphology in our lab, we've been able to examine relations to function using fMRI. And more importantly, we do so by analyzing the data at the individual subject level. So we take into account the individual differences in cortical morphology in relation to function. And these are some of the studies that uh, have investigated anatomical functional relationships using such methods. And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about four of these today. So to start, we have uh, the research of Zlatkina, uh, Veronica Zlatkina, who um, was a PhD student in the lab. She's now a research associate in the lab. And she was very interested in the morphology of the postcentral sulcus. We know from the pioneering work of Penfield and Rasmussen and other colleagues that uh, the postcentral gyrus is somatotopically organized. This is the famous somatosensory homunculus of Penfield here. And so Veronica was interested in how the postcentral sulcus relates to uh, sensory motor function. So in one study, she examined in vivo MRI, and she was able to demonstrate that the postcentral sulcus can be subdivided in consistently into five different segments, as you can see here. And she then examined how these five segments relate to specific aspects of sensory motor function. So she had uh, a separate set of subjects enter the scanner and they had to move different parts of their body depending on the instructions that appeared on the screen. So move the foot, the leg, the arm, the hand, the mouth, the tongue, or blinking of the eyes, all while fixating. And as the control task, it was simple fixation. And she was able to demonstrate uh, that there was a tight relationship between so sensory motor representations at different parts of the body and specific segments of the postcentral sulcus. You can see that shown really nicely, for example, in this image here. Uh, more recently, we've just submitted this work to uh, cerebral cortex, it's under review. Veronica uh, um, quantified the spatial variability and extent of each of these segments of the postcentral sulcus using volumetric and surface probability maps. So these are the maps, for example, of segment one that I'm showing you here. And she then looked at how each of these maps relates to uh, sensory motor activation peaks that had been reported in the literature. And that's what this image on the right is showing you. So basically, she was able to reproduce what she had previously demonstrated, namely that each segment of the postcentral sulcus could be rely reliably uh, related to specific sensory motor activation peaks. And the more dorsal segments, for example, were related to uh, sensory motor activation peaks of uh, the, the lower extremities, the foot, the leg, while the most ventral segments were related to activation peaks of the mouth, the lips, and the tongue. Moving more anteriorly into the dorsal premotor region, we have the study of Celine Amier. Uh, so she was a postdoctoral researcher in the lab, and uh, of course she's going to be presenting her own research as part of this symposium. So separate set of research. But Celine was interested in activity generated during visual motor hand-arm conditional responses and activity related to the frontal eye fields. And the reason for this is that in the monkey, these are quite separate areas. This has been established by lesion studies. It's been established by electrophysiological, uh, electrophysiological recordings in the monkey. Um, but in the human neuroimaging literature, these areas seem to consistently have overlapping coordinates at the junction between the superior frontal sulcus and the superior precentral sulcus. And so Celine wanted to investigate this by looking at individual morphology in relation to the functional peaks. So she put uh, a group of subjects into the scanner, and in the first experimental task, these subjects had to press uh, specific keys on a keyboard with a specific finger, depending on the color that appeared on the screen. So this is what we mean by a visual motor hand conditional response. It was dependent on the color that appeared on the screen. And as the control task, the subjects would simply press the same key, uh, always with the index finger. Um, no matter what color appeared on the screen. Uh, as a second experimental task, in order to activate uh, those voluntary saccades, she had subjects follow a dot on a screen for a certain amount of time. 
Um, and then as the control task, it was a simple fixation. And so Celine was able by studying the subjects at the individual subject level to demonstrate uh, that despite considerable variability in local sulcal morphology, uh, there were consistent relationships between anatomy and function. So activity related to the visuomotor hand conditional responses was always associated with the dorsal branch of the superior precentral sulcus, which shown as the blue peaks in some of these subjects that I'm showing you here. And activity related to the frontal eye fields was consistently located at the ventral branch of the superior precentral sulcus, so those red peaks in this image here. So uh, she was able to demonstrate that local morphology could predict functional organization in this region. And furthermore, that the organization of the dorsal premotor cortex was actually preserved from monkey to human. And so this is an average of the data um, across subjects. These crosses here represent the average coordinates, and you could see the organization of the, the average functional peaks here. And it really does reproduce what we know in the monkey, uh, where each of these uh, these areas can be uh, reliably separated in the dorsal premotor cortex. Moving on to the medial side of the hemisphere, we have the work of Zonia Hunkebutt, who was interested specifically in the parahippocampal gyrus. So we know from uh, the work of Brenda Milner with patient HM and also many other researchers that the parapocampal gyrus is important for consolidation of certain types of memory. And research has demonstrated, especially in neuroimaging, the potential existence of a parahippocampal place area, a region in the posterior parahippocampal cortex that seems to be active to uh, visualization of scenes or locations as opposed to um, objects or faces. And so Zanya was very interested in how uh, the cortex, specifically the entorhinal cortex, which lies on the gyrus more anteriorly, and the parapocampal cortex more posteriorly, what is the role of this cortex in spatial memory? So uh, as a first study, she examined the intricate patterns of the sulci in this region. So specifically the rhinal sulcus anteriorly shown in yellow here and the collateral sulcus proper uh, shown in blue here. And once she understood the morphology, she could then uh, go and study relationships to function. So she had 14 uh, healthy subjects who uh, had to learn the layout of a virtual city just by navigating this virtual uh, city on a computer screen. And you can see that this city had different landmarks in various locations. And so they would learn the layout of this virtual city through exploration and they had to uh, really consolidate that information. Uh, and then once they had learned the layout, they headed into the scanner uh, and they were given a random starting point, such as the bank shown here. And they had to navigate to some other landmark like the church, using the shortest distance. So they really had to retrieve that uh, cognitive map that they had established. As a control task, the subjects navigated a very similar city that was missing these anatomical, uh, oh, sorry, these, uh, these landmarks, and they would just follow uh, arrows that were put in front of them. So really not relying on that cognitive map. So Zonia was able to demonstrate that the sulcal morphology of this region could be consistently uh, used to describe the location of the activation peaks that had been generated. So she had noticed one cluster of peaks that was uh, generated where the anterior branch of the collateral sulcus proper meets the posterior branch. There was a second cluster of activation peaks generated at the posterior collateral sulcus proper, just where it uh, starts to meet with the lingual gyrus, and a third uh, cluster of peaks that was generated on the parabocampal extension of the collateral sulcus. And so in this study, she was able to demonstrate specific activation in the mid and posterior parapocampal cortex, so not the anterior parapocampal cortex, not the entorhinal cortex. And furthermore, these studies establish morphological landmarks uh, that could be related to these activation peaks. Finally, we have the study of Emily Siegel, who finished her PhD in the lab uh, several years ago. 
Emily was very interested in uh, the morphology of the angular gyrus and its role uh, of this region in uh, reading activity. So we know from patient studies, um, from uh, neuroimaging studies, that the angular gyrus in the language dominant hemisphere does uh, play a role in reading functions. And Emily had studied the morphology of the superior temporal sulcus and demonstrated that it can be consistently subdivided into three posterior branches that really define the angular gyrus of the parietal lobe. So Emily was then interested in figuring out how does the morphology of this region and these three branches relate to uh, reading function. And so she had nine subjects who entered the scanner. They had to view a word on a screen. They had to silently read the word and then write down that word. And as a control task, the subjects would view a picture of an object on a screen and write down the name of the object. And by subtracting these two tasks, Emily was trying to hone in on silent word reading. And what Emily was able to demonstrate, and you can see these are the individual subjects, uh, the anatomical and the functional data overlaid. And this is an average of the subject uh, peaks shown here on the left, was that there was a consistent relationship between reading related activity and the location of the central and the posterior branches of the caudal STS in every single subject. So in conclusion, we don't have much time left to go into even more detail, but thanks to advances in neuroimaging, we have a much better understanding of cortical morphology compared to the original studies of Eberstaller 1890 and colleagues. We've come quite a long way since that pioneering work that really set the stage for this research. And by examining sulcal morphology at the individual subject level in relation to functional activations, we have been able to establish specific morphological landmarks that can be used for navigating the brain. And you can imagine that this would be very useful, for example, during neurosurgery, during tissue resection of an epileptic focus or of a tumor. If you understand these anatomical functional relationships, it can be quite beneficial. So with that, I would like to thank the Petrides Lab and especially uh, past and present members whose research uh, I discussed today. Um, I'd like to thank the OHBM committee for selecting our symposium for this year's conference. I would like to thank the other symposium speakers who you'll hear from, Céline Agnier, Olivier Coulon, and Katya Hoyer. I'd also like to thank Nicole Eichert for helping me to organize this symposium. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>